Welcome to the Super Little Challenges Podcast Series 2. I'm Daniel Thomas, and my guest today is high performance coach Di Emanuel. Di has mastered the art of leading by example and knows just how challenging it can be to juggle life's responsibilities while prioritizing health and happiness. Di's positivity is contagious. We had an awesome chat. He shares the realization he had as a teenager, which set him on his way, how he manages his time, the meaning of his whole life manifesto, and we both share why we quit drinking. Enjoy this one, guys. Because it's essentially about challenges, I'm very interested in one, what have been some major challenges in your journey and how that's led to where you are now and what you're focused on through your work. Love it. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's like, <laughs> let's bring out the notepad. How many should I list right now? You know? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I'm, I'm definitely no stranger to challenges, as most of us aren't. But uh, I guess it's what we do in the face of those challenges, right? Uh, that's really where our character is tested and uh, but also formed, I think. You know, like, I really think it's it's character development, right? Like, I mean, it, geesh. I imagine when you were on that mountain, <laughs> you know, there's moments where you're thinking, what are we doing? <laughs> Why yeah. are we doing this? You know, and, and it, that mental inner voice, right? Like just like, you know, just turn around. It's way more comfortable down low, <laughs> you know, but that continuation or perseverance uh, and, and also that natural resiliency you build by pushing through and persevering regardless of the challenge. Right. And uh, wow, you're a wonderful testament to that. But also I, I got to go back and listen to a bunch of your older shows, man, because uh, it sounds like there's some good gold nuggets of wisdom in those, you know? Yeah, it's interesting. It's like I was actually just in the sauna at, at the gym earlier. Yeah. yeah. And because uh, in Germany, saunas are big, right? It, it's um, huge. It's like everybody's <laughs> born with one, right? <laughs> I try and sit through 15 minutes at, at 90 degrees. Mm. And mm. that last that last five minutes is exactly what you're saying. It's like that's when it ramps up, right? And that's yeah. when that's when I when I I I become aware of like the self-talk you know, things come, I start kind of just that last block of time is yeah. really, it's, it's the most testing part. And if I can, if I can get through that, mm -hmm. there's quite a benefit to it. And then there's actually, mm -hmm. there's an ice bucket that you can pull oh, over your head yeah. <laughs> and wow. on the walk, on the wow. walk from the sauna to the ice bucket, I start talking myself out of pulling the, the, the ice bucket, you know, <laughs> yeah. in, in the five meter space, I give myself every reason not to, not to, and, and I literally just have to, I just have to ignore it. And some days, some days I don't, and I, I give in and I take the exit and I don't do it, especially in winter and stuff. But, um, mm -hmm. lately I've been just not allowing that, that self talk to stop me from pouring the, the, the cold water over the head. Good for you. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> It's the one thing that really challenges me the most is feeling cold. Like I really dislike feeling cold. Uh, it's probably why our, our family tends to gravitate anytime we go traveling. It's always to warmer climates. And it might be because I'm Canadian and, you know, this great white north here. It's also why I live in Vancouver versus other parts of Canada because it's the climate's the most forgiving here. You know, we don't really get snow unless we want to drive to the mountains to get it. Uh, but man, it makes me feel so uncomfortable being cold. Uh, so ice plunges is like my form of challenging myself as well. Like just getting in there and it's just like, uh, the, those, that, that voice goes from whispering to screaming, to <laughs> screaming. Right in your head <laughs> and, and learning to silence it or at least negotiate with it to be like, Hey, Let's make a deal here. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. you, 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 you just be a little bit more supportive and trust me, good things will happen, you know, but uh, that, that self-talk it's, it's amazing what happens when you're pushed into very uncomfortable situations. I mean, it becomes, you can't ignore the voice anymore, right? Like it's like megaphone in your ear. And uh, that's so cool though. I mean, good for you. Cause uh, that's uh, especially coming out of something that's really hot, going to something extremely cold. Ooh, that's like, man. Yeah, I'm a bit of a sucker for punishment, but I, I find it <laughs> I find I find the benefit, like especially the the routine of it and stuff, pretty yeah. cool. Um, I love it. Good for you, man. Yeah. Way way to to model and mentor uh, in a great way, you know. Like it's, I mean, that's how we all learn, right? It's mentorship and modeling, and that's exactly what you're doing. Uh, does your 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 son ever join you for for any of these uh, seemingly challenges? <laughs> Actually, that's a good. I thought it was. We were jumping in the ice lake here at one point, and mm. I thought it was. Uh, I thought you know, as fathers, 
as us yeah. super dads, I think our, our our children are always always watching and observing. Yes, correct. Yeah. And so when one time when we were jumping in the icy lake here in in winter, um, he wanted he came down and uh, it was actually so frozen over that we couldn't jump in. <laughs> so he he was he was trying to chip away at the ice, oh. but there was no there was no chance. But he got he so he didn't see that, but he got a grasp of of what I was doing. And then in a, uh, in the river here, the old river here, which gets quite cold. He, he, he went in there sort of knee high for 20 seconds and was like, look, Papa, I'm, I'm doing it, you know? So. That's awesome. Oh man. Uh, how fun is that? My, my wife and I made a decision a long time. Cause we were very young parents, you know, my, my, my daughters are now 18 and 20 and, uh, one's out of the house. The other one will be, you know, moving off to university come the end of August. So, uh, you, you know, this, this we're on the precipice of being empty nesters for the first time in, in literally 20 years, you know? So it's my wife and I are sort of going through this sort of transitionary phase where we're like, what the hell are we going to do? <laughs> you know, like, well, what, whoa, what's it like going to look like? So th- th- that's an interesting dynamic. Um, but, but on the, the flip side of that, you know, when we were young parents and being the first within our friend groups to have kids, it was almost a novelty. So we had a lot of support actually, if people being willing, it's like, Hey, can we take Chardonnay our, our eldest at the time? You know, when she was a baby, people are like one, two years old. And cause you know, you get these, these early 20 somethings being like, Oh, it can be kind of fun to be like an auntie or an uncle, you know, or to to have this young child to tend to because it was just this excitement, right? Uh, this, per, you know, that that uh, parental spirit in all of us sort of comes to the fruition when you 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 are in that energy, right? When you're around this young sort of newborn, and and uh, so we we were very fortunate. We had a lot of support, but we also made a decision, you know, early on that. You know, childcare is very expensive in Canada, and, and it's an issue that they're trying to to alleviate. They're trying to subsidize with government now, and which is great, and I think it's going in the right direction, but still not quite there. And it wasn't available for us back then. And so we looked at what my wife was doing career wise and her income, and what it would cost for childcare. And so we made a decision that you know we wanted one parent to be full time with the kids at all times, at least during those initial years before they went into school. And and so as a result, I, I recommitted to work to, to to really go down into my own businesses and and generate that support so I could support my family, right? Like that, that, um, that income. And, um, but when it came to babysitters and whatnot, we would often just take our kids to everything that we did. So I, I was actively competing in CrossFit for, for a lot of years. So they come around to all the competitions with us. Um, I'm a very active speaker for the last 15 years. So I would have to be speaking at lots of events and traveling. We just take the kids along. Uh, Toastmasters, prime example, you know, speaking in public, right? Speaking in front of groups. I mean, that is a, it's a serious fear. I mean, most people would rather be in the coffin than give the eulogy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> at the funeral because a lot of people are very intimate and, and I'm one of those, you know, I, I've dealt with social anxiety my entire life, but it was one of those challenges I wanted to overcome because I wanted to make a difference in the world. And I knew being able to communicate a message and support people, especially large groups, I had to overcome that challenge, you know, and that was one big one that stuck with me and it's still there. I just learned to channel it in a much more positive way, even though it really depletes me when I do events, you know, and I do public speaking, I, I usually have to have a couple of days to recover afterwards just because I, that natural, um, introvert within me wants to like, okay, I need some me time, you know? And, um, but I would take our kids, uh, Christy and I would take our kids and and very often they'd be invited, you know, even at six, seven years old to come up and speak in front of this group of 30 adults. Right. And, and so um, it's been really neat because they've sort of accompanied us and seen us, uh, you know, pushing to be better ourselves. And they themselves have really inherited that spirit now, which is really neat to see, but it was really not us trying to force them. It was just, taking them along, not really giving them a choice uh, to not join us, you know, and and whether they wanted to participate when they were there, that was up to them. But very often, just by osmosis and seeing what was going on and the positive energy and vibe and also the attention they would get from the other adults, making them feel very welcomed and safe, they would often say, hey, can we try? And I thought that was awesome. You know, it's, it's just creating the space where they feel safe. People say, hey, mom, dad, can I give that a try? You know, like, and I, and I think that's exciting. That's that's a great um skill i think to be able to impart in our children right and it sounds like you've done just that with your son so yeah for sure <laughs> thanks yeah yeah it's huge. no no for sure and i think i think parenting uh <laughs> parenting kind of holds a mirror up to our 
to, to okay. ourselves is that, you know, there's no kind of greater, great, you, you hear about it before you're a parent and the kind of cliches and stuff, but yeah, there's a lot, a lot of growth and testing that comes from, from, from parenting. And the thing I've consciously been trying with, with my son is to be as present as possible, you know, um, how do you how do you find that the 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 staying present when you know you've you've obviously got a lot of business is going on and engage you know speaking engagements and everything how do you balance how do you balance that present time when you're with your family? It's a great question. It's a great question, and it's definitely in itself to use the term again. It, it is challenging, you know, because there's a lot going on. But we only have so many hours a week, and I. I gave up a long time ago this whole idea of time management. I was like, the more I try to manage time, the more I feel like I'm failing at it. <laughs> so I was like, forget that. Um, but what I did was a little shift or a reframe, you know, and it's this idea of managing commitments and managing how we're committing that block of time, if you will. And and so to try to take this, this rather intangible thing and make it tangible, uh, I just got really, really good at time blocking, you know, so I, I live by my calendar. I really do. And I, I love to I'm kind of a nerd this way. I like to color coordinate my commitments, you know, it's so like podcasts are like a light green on my calendar as an example, or client conversations are a dark green, um, events that have to be in person are yellow, my fitness, anything that's fitness or health related is red. And, and what's really neat is if you get really good at using a Google calendar and it syncs with all devices, you know, and all platforms. So it's a, it's a really easy tool to, to start to understand and use. But when you look at your day, blocking little commitments every day of what you're going to do. Now there's certain commitments that, you know, if we have a traditional nine to five, like I've had in the past, well, that gets a big block of commitment time every week. You know, I also know why well, I want to get quality sleep. I've got to commit a certain period of day to my sleep as well. Now I've got, what do I got left? And, and now it's getting really specific on how we're going to commit what's remaining. Um, and one of our, our core family values is family. And so as such, I have to make sure that those are the non-negotiables that I prioritize first into my calendar. So my fitness, uh, my family, those are two non-negotiables. So they get allocation first when I'm planning out my week. And here's the cool part. When you look at Google Calendar and you start to color coordinate or, or give labels to the types of commitments that you're going to be making regularly, you just think about this as categories, you can look at time trends. This is where Google Calendar will literally say, oh, hey, this week fitness, you've got three hours blocked off or, or committed. Oh, family, I've only got one hour committed this week. Ooh, there, there's some imbalance here, you know, work. Oh, gosh, I got 22 hours of commitments. So I start to very clearly see where there might be imbalances. And I I set straight and I, I'm like, OK, I need some more family time allocated this week. And so I'll talk to the family. It's a little more challenging now because my girls have their own independent lives and trying to corral them into anything. It's, it's hard because we have to factor in boyfriends and, you know, just just logistics are challenging. All right. And uh, um, but overall, it, it allows me to get really clear on why I might be feeling a certain way. You see, if I don't have a lot of time committed to family specific present time, us going for a hike, going for a walk, having a dinner, you know, having a movie night. If I don't have that time allocated, it's amazing how life just gets in the way. It just happens, right? And I start to feel very disconnected. I know that if my family, uh, let's just think of my family tank, that, that little tank within me is, is running dry. I feel really disconnected, off purpose, just not myself. And and I know the way best way to write that is well, I need some family time, you know. Um, but it's becoming mindful of those habits of our commitments and how we're allocating or not more, more importantly, not allocating that time blocking. So uh that's what I've been doing. And it's been working great for gosh, over 10 years now. I've been really I'd almost say religious about this, you know, like it's very much ritualistic for me. Uh and I invite anybody and everybody to try it, you know, give yourself a, it takes a couple months to really get in the flow and the hang of it. It. But if you can sustain it for about 60 days, it will become a ritual for you too. And, and it's, I honestly believe it's life-changing. It is life-changing. Like it, it changed my life. It really did. And, uh, and I just feel so much better for it. So hopefully that gives them a little bit of insights on what's been something that's worked for me really well, you know? The, the visual thing's really cool. That resonates. I actually do a similar thing. Maybe not as, um, I could listening to what you say, I could do that way better, I think, but I, 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 I find the visual thing 
as you say, it's, it's, it, it shows you what's, what's out of, out of whack and then you can right. adjust accordingly. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I came from a, you know, a corporate world in the past as well. And I think what we're saying here, it just, you know, the, the nine to five thing to me is just, it's a very flawed as humans, it's a very flawed model because losing that block of time when you're actually quite just naturally unproductive in the afternoon because you've been sitting in the same spot for X number of hours and then you get home and you're tired and then bang, you're into this. It's re- It took me a long time to to break out of that that model and now, now I'm finding actually shifting spaces throughout the day is important as well and mm. shifting activities and actually doing a a range of different things within the day and shifting from one thing to another but yeah it can get away from it a little bit as you say so Mm. coordinating it and making it really really visual and getting that to um uh to it like you said to ensure you're putting your time which is the most precious thing we have into your core values uh first and foremost um, is is pretty cool. Well said. Yeah, it's a. I, I'm a very much a visual person, so I like to have that visual representation. It it just it brings things into focus for me much more quickly. Um, but I really like the time trending function of Google calendars because it's really quick. Like it just gives you a summation of the week ahead or month ahead of where is that time being allocated directly. You know, and so really quick, I can see. I'm like, oh, geez, this month, <laughs> man, I'm gonna be. I I know by the end of the month. If I continue to follow this trend, I'm not going to be feeling very good about myself. You know, my mental health will be definitely in a more challenging uh, place. And it's just going to be a lot of work to write that ship again, you know, just because then you have to go through. I have a whole series of protocols I do when I have to sort of have that hard reset, if you will. And for those that are PC people or remember the old PCs, the control alt delete, (laughs) the hard (laughs) reset. Um, I I have sort of a a control alt delete that I do for myself when I get into that tough spot, you know, And, and it's about a three day process to just give myself a grounding you know and 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 retool refocus relaunch reignite whatever you want to say it's I, I have to get back to that solid foundation so i can press off again you know and uh so i need that, that reset the concept of doing what we might call nothing is actually hard as i think we tend to think we have to, we have to keep keep on the yeah. keep on the the treadmill of life or whatever but it's like yeah. it's actually exactly what you're saying to take a reset so there's a book called the way of, the way of the superior man and uh, i know for everybody that's listening i know it kind of sounds like a chauvinistic title <laughs> you know my <laughs> wife when i first brought it home she's like what is this you know <laughs> and, uh, she's like what, what you know i think this is an ego buy you know like yeah and i'm like no 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 um but it's a really interesting volume uh, of work that this man's dedicated his life to but it's specifically in the in supporting men you know, men that represent themselves as men or, or identify as men. And, and, uh, but there's a, a really well written chapter that talks about the power of the pause and this ability for us men. We really are challenged to just take a pause for a minute to just do the internal work, to do that internal reflection. It's not like we have to be go, go, go all the time, even though often with society's pressures and some of the cliches or stereotypes that that have become, well, they've been perpetuated for literally decades from, from one generation to the next. He's challenging that saying, no, it's okay to take a pause. So you, you just, you know, what you said is like on point, man. And I, I think you'd actually really like some of his work. He's also got a really good podcast. So uh, David Dida, uh, Way of the Superior Man. Yeah. I hope you're enjoying the conversation. A quick shout out to another podcast, Wolf Cub Film Club, which is essentially a film review show hosted by me and my dad. We're both filmmakers, so we check out some pretty cool documentaries and share our filmmaking knowledge. We also share some personal anecdotes from our own lives as father and son. Wolf's over in Australia where I'm from and I'm here in Germany. So please check it out. That's Wolf Cub Film club, wherever you get your pods. I like taking on physical challenges. So I'm actually doing the trifecta with the Spartan organization at the end of August, which means I'm doing the 20K beast, the five and the 10K all in the same weekend. And uh, so I've never done anything like that before. This will be my first time, but I've got a few months. I've been 
actively uh, conditioning myself to be ready for that. So I like challenges just like you and uh, especially physical ones, because it's the mental challenge that I get from it that really I never I always come out of it changed. Do you know what I mean? Like and, and I always have to remind myself because when you're going through it. Oh man, let's be honest. It's there's a lot of days. It's not fun, okay? It's not. <laughs> but I have to remind myself. I remember what I feel like after I've accomplished it. You know that 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 belief in myself goes to another level, and uh, and I love that feeling. You know, I really do. I love that feeling of accomplishment. I I often joke, and I'm waiting to get a cease and desist letter from Nike. But you know, <laughs> Nike their their slogans just do it, which I think is beautiful. Just do it, man. Just do it. But what if we changed it to just did it? You know, like what if we started to celebrate? Hey, man, I don't need motivation to just do it. <laughs> I did it. Mm. You know, like the, the acknowledgement of the completion. You know, now I, I don't think Nike's going to change a, a, a trillion dollar brand <laughs> to a new slogan, but but I, I often think about that. You know, and, and celebrating the just uh, doing of whatever the activity is, you know, of the completion of, and how we feel afterwards. Right. Like, cause that's, it wires the brain very quickly to that reward mechanism, right. That dopamine serotonin. I mean, we get all these chemicals that get start spewing out, making us feel good, but it also locks in a new belief of who we are and what we're potential, uh, could be. If you can share what the whole life manifesto is. Oh, <laughs> well, um, so I've been in the fitness and wellness space for almost three decades. My gosh, that's like a long time. <laughs> Just saying that, I'm like, wow. <laughs> you know, like since I was 17, I've actively been supporting people with change, you know, uh, and it started more as physical change uh, because i that's what I went through. At, at age 15, I was at my heaviest. I was, you know, classified as morbidly obese and I went through a big change and it took about 18 months to realize that change. But by age 17, something very interesting happened. You know, a friend of my parents came to the house and wanted to speak to me before they talked to my parents. Like they're like, dad, where's your parents? Oh, they're out back gardening or whatever. And like, okay. And they just sort of stood there at the door looking at me, you know, like a deer in headlights. And I'm like, mm -hmm, okay, what do you need? Like I told you they're back there, you know, like, what do you want? <laughs> like, and, and they're like, well, actually, before we talk to your mom, can uh, we talk to you? You know, and, and this is originally the husband, but then the husband and wife eventually sat down with me. But the, the husband sat down with me and I'm like, oh, gosh, what did I do last week? Am I in trouble? Like, that's what I start thinking, right? <laughs> like an adult that's twice your age asks you for some time to sit down and talk. I'm like, oh, man, I must be in trouble. First thing out of the mouth is like, wow, you know, we've seen what you've done over the last couple of years. And now you're just you've changed. You know, you lost the weight. You're fit. You're healthy. You're happy. Can you help us? We want to make some changes. Now, this is the first time in my life, Daniel, that I felt I had something of value to offer somebody else. Like, really, it was the first time. You know, my first 17 years of life, I actually felt like I have something to offer. Someone sees me to have some value. You know, because I'll be honest, at that time in my life, I didn't have a lot of self-esteem. And, and even though I had changed it or this exterior, the interior was still hurting. I was still that little morbidly obese child that, that was holding back on life. You know, and and it was in that moment I was like, wow, yeah, I I I'd like to help you. Sure, I can do that. And that was my first taste of coaching and mentorship. It wasn't paid, <laughs> but I knew that it didn't matter about the payment because the fulfillment I got from it was more important to me. And and I knew in that moment that the for the rest of my life, doing that would be involved in some level or way. I knew I'd be helping others. And so, you know, fast forward, <laughs> I, I, I had a business that sold fitness equipment, accessories, supplements, apparel. Uh, we were national across Canada. I was a co-founder of that organization. Did that for 17 years while also training and coaching people on the side or my teams and uh, scaled up to, to about eight figures a year. And eight years ago, I realized, you know, I'm just not fulfilled with this path. Like, I don't feel connected anymore. I don't I just didn't like what I was doing anymore. And so I won't transitioned out of that business and not 100% sure on what I was going to do, <laughs> but that was okay. That was okay because I knew I was capable. I also had my, my family's support on that change, you know, and uh, long and short of it, there was a period of time there where I felt, you know, all these populations, my wife and I had started running these free events every Sunday morning. We call them Sunday fun days. Uh, well, actually, Sunday fun day throwdowns, and it was workouts that we would lead in group format 
uh, at one of my physical retail locations. We had a training center in the back and we would just invite people, come on down. You want to have, you want to, you're intimidated by fitness. You don't have a supportive community. Listen, just come down, just show up and we'll help you. We'll support you. And not only us, but there's a whole community of cool people here that are on the same wavelength. And this grew very quickly by word of mouth. And, you know, it got to the point where we were having about 100 people every Sunday morning showing up for these free fitness sessions. Between you and I, it was also a, a testing lab for me, <laughs> you know, because I was able to try different philosophies, different coaching prompts, different ways of supporting so many types of people. I mean, we had teenagers all the way up to people in their 80s. Like we had a full spectrum. I mean, we had Hirsch. I mean, he was a former heroin addict that had passed out one evening after an overdose wasn't found for 48 hours, but his leg was pinned behind him. So when he woke up in the hospital, fortunately, he was alive still, but he had lost his leg. You know, so here's this guy showing up, 60 pounds overweight, on a prosthetic leg, a, a former addict, right? And he's like, I, I just want to get healthier, you know? And 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 it was awesome to see the community just welcome Hershey in, you know, because he was the most jovial, happy guy you'd ever meet and supportive no matter what. And, and so it was such a diverse group. And I started to learn so much by helping these people and hearing the same sort of challenges pop up again and again, or the whys, the why nots. Um, and so I started to support those people. And what came of that was this whole life fitness manifesto, this sort of just very simple doctrine of ways to literally live into your best version, you know, and, and it did start with the fitness first focus. Initially, now it's more of a mental health first focus. But back then it was fitness first, because I knew if you just moved your body with a little bit of purpose every day, did a little bit of mindful meditation, and you did a little bit of personal development. And now I'm talking 30 minutes a day, which is only 2% of every 24 hours this is why I call it the 2% solution to the better you. You know, it's, it's quite literally 15 minutes of movement with purpose, It's just body weight based, you got enough room to put a towel on the ground, you got enough room to move. You know, and then that follows with five minutes of mindful meditation, followed by 10 minutes of a very specific and intentional personal development. You know, listen to a great podcast like yours, Daniel, or maybe watching a TED talk, listening to an audiobook, reading a book, having a conversation with a mentor. I, I'm not here to prescribe what the 10 minutes is, but it's really what do you need? And it's filling that muscle between the ears with something positive that's going to help enrich your life, but also enrich those lives around you. And this simple 30 minutes, I ask people to commit to 28 days. And every day for 28 days, that's what you do. You commit 30 minutes, non-negotiable time to yourself. People are like, well, is it worth it? I'm like, well, damn, you're worth it. Like, don't ask me if it's worth doing this. You are worth it, <laughs> you know, you, for your own health and well-being. Because currently you're doing zero. So this is a big improvement, you know, <laughs> like 30 minutes a day. I'm not asking for everything here. I'm just asking for a little bit. Everybody at the end of that 28 days had significant shifts, especially around beliefs and self-perspective. You know, they went from, from I can't to now I can, you know, or I want to, where before it was like, I don't know if I should. And it's just this mental shift, you know, and that's why I say it's more of a mental health focus, even though we're using vehicles that are well known and, and well spoken about, but it's just packaged in a different way in a format that makes it a little bit more accessible and digestible for people. You know, people are like, well, I can commit 30 minutes a day. I'm like, good. Great. That's all I'm asking for. Here's the process. Do this for the next 30, 28 days and let me know how it goes. Inevitably, huge shifts. And, and so that was the whole Life Fitness Manifesto. We put together this whole program and support system, put it in a format of a book and just delivered it to the masses, you know? And uh, and it's been a real amazing process. I'm actually writing in an updated version of it right now, which I hope to release next year because uh, so many things have changed. I'm now in my mid 40s. And when I wrote that book, I was more in my mid thirties and that decade I've learned so much and experienced so much change myself and, and learned and, and the health industry has just advanced tremendously in the last decade. Uh, so I, I really feel the need to update a lot of the content and the information and, and the way I support and coach people now and mentor them is also different. It's, it's evolved. Uh, so, so that's, that's it, man. That's the, the whole life fitness manifesto. It's obviously no end to internet quotes out there. And, uh, and I think mm -hmm. we often spend too much time reading them than actually <laughs> applying them. But one, I, one, one I do uh, like that, that I think of when, when you're talking is that, you know, we're, we're under no obligation to be the same person we were yesterday. Thanks. Thank you. 
yeah, as you say, you can just make a decision to devote a small block of time out of a lot of minutes in the day to something that's going to benefit exactly as you're saying, like half an hour, 28 days can have really significant uh, massive effects. So the beautiful thing about the compounding effect, right? Like it just, I mean, who, 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 I think it was Einstein, right? He was like the two strongest forces in the world are love and compounding interest, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because it's that compounding of good on good on good to great, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, that little 30 minute deposit every day, it can work really positively in, in favor for our own growth, you know, and, and I, I think that's where sometimes we run ashore as people in the health industry is we are very quick to quantify and prescribe. You know, we, we like to quantify things. Oh, like how fast is your lap or how much can you bench press? You know, like what's your waist circumference? What's the number on the scale? Right. We're very quick to quantify things. What about qualifying things? You know, like how do you feel when you do those activities? You know, like how do you feel now, three months later after committing to do those consistently? And you have, you know, like what about that conversation? You know, to lock in the feeling and that connection with the activity itself. Right. And, um, and, it, and it's interesting because I, I do want to have full disclosure here and transparency. Uh, you know, I did a TEDx talk, uh, gosh, about 18 months ago. And even though I'm someone that's it's fairly well known in the health and wellness space, I've also had my other struggles from a health and wellness perspective, a couple in particular, one of which was I talked about that inner child that was still very damaged. I didn't do any inner work because I mean, at that age, you know, 17, 18 years old, I'm all about like, I really want a girlfriend, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I want to look better naked, you know, like it, there was very surface motivations and I didn't do any internal work. It was all external. And then when I got into my career, it was all professional development, no personal development. Even though there's a lot of overlap, there was always that, that, that direction I was going to develop myself as a business person, an entrepreneur, you know, and it was always very ego, 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 look look at me, look at me, look at me, you know, and uh, not very fulfilling. And as a result of that, I I learned very early on that I could change my own self perspective by through influencing it with alcohol. And and also at times that would lead to narcotic use, you know, specifically cocaine. And uh, I'm not proud of this, uh, but it's the truth. And it's who I was. And, and I was always reinforced with my circle of influence, those, those people that I thought were my, my friends and my community, my closest friends, that inner circle, if you will. They were very much the same. And, but they liked hanging out with fun guy die, you know, because I was very jovial when I would do those things. And to the point that I believe that people enjoyed that version of me better than who I was or who I was becoming. And, and that was oof, from age 18-ish to about 33. So about 15 years, that was a, a normal for me, you know, so I, you know, founded a company, uh, you know, started a lot of great initiatives, was doing a lot of really good things, you know, having my family. Uh, but yet on the other side of things, there was this whole darker side of me, you know, and, um, and so there was a lot of conflict I was dealing with, you know, a lot of conflict. And, uh, and it was at age 32, 33, I made a commitment to just go one year without drinking. And in that one year, everything changed, but I, I needed help. I did. And, and it was the first time I was really, truly vulnerable with my wife, as well as other people in my network and saying, listen, this is where I'm at. And this is what I'm doing. This is how I feel. And can you help me? And as a man who identifies as a man, who is, <laughs> uh, could give the air of being very confident, almost to the point of being cocky when I was at my younger age, um, people were taken aback. You know, they're like, whoa. I had no idea because I was really good at putting on the mask, pretending everything's great because from the outside looking in, it, it looked great, but I was so unfulfilled, you know, and uh, in that one year, you know, I worked with a psychologist for a few months, worked with the relationships counselor with my wife to work on communication. And, you know, first session in, she's like, nah, you know, Christy, I think it's better if Di comes back on his own. <laughs> and so, you know, like, I, I really, I, I went all in, I went all in with support systems. And I also had to cut out a lot of people in my life, to be honest. I, I, I did because that sphere of influence weren't ready for my change. They weren't in a place to accept that. And every time I'd show up, even though I wasn't drinking or choosing to do those things, it made them feel uncomfortable. You know, so my phone stopped ringing. Those texts stopped coming. The invitations weren't there anymore. And I was totally okay with that. 
I found a new community, new uh, association. And in that one year, everything changed. And, you know, I got to the end of the year, my wife said, hey, should we celebrate? I can't believe you did it. I was like, I can't believe I did it. <laughs> you know, like, and, and my kids were both under the age of six at this time. So they were, really don't have any recollection of how I was when I was at my worst, um, which I feel very fortunate about that I had the change when they were so young. But now they, they've heard a lot of the stories. They've heard my conversations. They've heard my TED talk, you know, so they're like, wow, we didn't know that, you know, and, and, uh, Long and short of this this preamble here or, or amble is um, my wife's like, hey, you want to celebrate? Share a bottle of wine on the porch while we watch the sunset tonight. I was like, babe, that sounds awesome. But you know what? So much has changed and I'm feeling so good after just one year. What if I kept going? I'm coming up on 15 years. 15 years, like, which I am baffled by, right? But because of that one decision to say no to alcohol, I was able to say yes to a future I couldn't even imagine was possible. And I pinch myself at times, you know? I've got a lot of flaws. Hey, I'll admit that. Come on, who doesn't? But I have clear mind and heart, and I can deal with those things. You know, I can speak to those things because I've learned how to communicate that. I've learned how to be vulnerable with authenticity to create better connection with me and others around me. And I don't care if that makes you feel uncomfortable. That's not me. That's you, <laughs> you know, like, and that's okay. Do you want some help with that? And, and that's where, you know, the Mentorship Mondays movement sort of evolved from was this, this group of guys that would get together every Monday night. It started while we were living in Bali for a few years uh, before the pandemic, uh, me and my family. And I started having this weekly Monday night meetup. Guys get together for just authentic conversation, hold space for each other to be vulnerable, more so practice the skill of opening up and being honest and transparent without any worry that anything we say will be used against us. Kind of Vegas rules. You know, what happens at Mentorship Monday stays at Mentorship Monday, you know, <laughs> and it was incredible. Just incredible. Again, I learned so much from that experience. And uh, the, the group still meet. Uh, there, there's a gentleman by the name of Nick Wood who continues to facilitate the online meetings. There's three calls every Monday, different time zones, one in Europe, one in uh, Eastern, uh, well, sorry, the Eastern time zone and Pacific time zone as well. So uh, lots of opportunities. They're free to attend. And so, you know, any men out there that are like, oh, that sounds interesting. I'd like to check that out. Just just go to my Instagram feed. There's a link there to check it out and sign up for a call. And you just show up on Zoom and just experience it. Just just show up just to be part of it. And you'll realize we are more alike than we are different. But because we don't open up and share, we don't realize that. And so we sit there looking at other men. And, and this is what I used to do. So uh, not project here, but this is what I was. I would look at men and I would size them up. I would peacock. I would try to it was just, it was so silly, you know, like, but that was what I had learned through the modeling and the mentorship that I had received in my early days, my early twenties and my twenties, even to my early thirties. That was what was being modeled around me. So that's what I believed I had to do too. It's nice to see when there's a different way, you know, and it feels so much more connected and, and fulfilled, joyful, happy. I mean, you, you, you can use all those terms and, and that part of that transition is really what helped that. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. we we are all alike and your traje trajectory is quite similar to mine actually wow Oof. even in terms even in terms of um timing and that that block of time between 20s and 30s and uh my decision to quit drinking and the loss of people that i was fulfilling a certain entertaining role and and then you know that the the phone stopped ring and the text stopped um and yeah very, very some some very similar um decisions and choices there and ultimate clarity mm. um particularly with the giving up the booze you know it clouded it clouded me um you know it was a form of escapism for me yeah and you know, I'm quite a determined, a driven person, but it was it was just not allowing me to function at my best, and it was it was hindering me from dealing with the stuff that I actually needed to. Um, obviously, you know, becoming a father, you know, priorities and things changed, but it was a similar similar deal in that I thought I actually it, it's interesting the visual thing because I, I had a big I had a big calendar, mm -hmm. and I thought. I'll just 
I'll just mark on the calendar when I think I've had too many beers. Like if I classify it as, as perhaps, you know, and I, and so I'd put like a blue tick and then, um, I started noticing that there was quite a few blue ticks, which were nights I'd considered were probably unnecessary in terms of how much I'd drunk. And so I thought I'll just try and reduce these blue marks. Mm -hmm. And I found it quite difficult. And then I didn't, I didn't like that, that, that it had a kind of hold on me. So then at the same thing, I was like, I'll just go a month. And then the month finished and it was similar. Shall we, you know, well done. Shall we celebrate? And I was like, no, I want to roll on. Yeah. And now it's been now it's been well over five years. So oh, it's um, standing. Oh man, that's freaking fantastic. Yeah. So it's just this <clears throat> this hero's journey that we're yeah, that seems to to you know it's amazing when you just hear you hear these similarities in our individual but um yeah. sim similar similar journeys a lot, you know. So yeah, very cool. Very cool. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for sharing that, by the way. I I, uh, I respect that tremendously, but also just, it, I'm curious. And this is more so just, I'm wondering if you've had similar observations or, or you've had some of the people that stopped calling or texting before, or have any reached back out to you again since, just intimating that maybe they're in a place wanting to make change now. Have anybody uh, sort of circled back? Uh, it Well, <laughs> It's a little because I moved countries three times. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> in five years, it's that. <laughs> no, no, because well, you've been since... in Germany ten years, right? <laughs> yeah. No, because I I initially went to London in a rock band, and I oh, ended up wow. and yeah. So I so <laughs> nice. so my whole thing, um, my whole thing was that I thought I was going to be similar to what you mm -hmm. said in 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 this kind of external. Um, thing you're chasing i thought i thought i was going to be like a big rock star and go to london and be a rock star nice i i ended up in germany with a family as a result <laughs> which was so much more fulfilling than any of the the kind of rock and roll world not p performing was amazing but but that kind of mm. world the um, there, huh? yeah. but trans going back to transitioning from country so i went to from from london to to Germany and Australia in between where, you know, where I grew mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. um, it's the ultimate test of, of friendships. The distance is the ultimate test. So the crew, the crew I have around me now are so solid because we've, we've uh, thrived through all these changes of country. Um, but I have, I have had, I have had maybe a handful of, Mm -hmm. of people that I've chosen to, to, to work through stuff with that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. A lot of people have, mm -hmm. and people that I haven't expected have turned to me and said, ah, oh, you know, how did you kick that? Um, I, you know, I have had that where, where people are like, oh, I'm curious, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the, you know, the, the, the judgment I had to navigate in those early days, because like, I think you said mm -hmm. you had some social anxiety. Yeah. So did I, and I, and I was the life of the party. Um, and then when I chose to, <laughs> when I chose to remove that lubricator, mm -hmm. uh, I was like, Jesus, what the, what, what the heck am I now? Like, um, who am I now at these, these events? But I think that also helped me take ownership of it because mm -hmm. I really had to, to take ownership of, of my, my choice around that and just, mm -hmm. um, the more the more I stepped into owning that choice, that's when people were like, "Oh man, I I, I think I might cut back a bit or follow you." You know, the the best what I find classic is talking about being sober when everyone's drunk. Yeah. Oh gosh. It's, <laughs> well, it's, it, that was the, the easiest filter for me. I remember we a few times getting invited to go watch UFC with my my friends because that was something we do: we go to the pub and watch UFC, right? And I, you know, two rounds in, I'm like trying because I, I felt this need or desire to have deeper conversation deeper connection i mean that's what i realized i really wanted and what was lacking in my life and so here i was thinking these are all my mates you know this will be fine i'll i'll we'll have these conversations i can show up i'll be sober i'll just drink my soda water or, or whatever back then it was like diet coke you know and uh um <laughs> 
two rounds in, you know, I realized, gosh, this is futile. <laughs> you know, this is, they're, they're not going to remember. They don't even want to talk like that. Those aren't conversations they want to talk. I just realized it's like, why am I here? You know, why I got, and it became very easy for me to just also say no to a lot of invitations. Cause I was just like, you know, I, I know where it's going to go. And I just, at the end of the night, I feel like, Oh, what a waste of time and mm. energy and, and presence you know, and uh, so I can relate a lot to that. But I also had a bit of an identity crisis, like you were describing. You know, I was like, I don't know how to act right now. I, 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 it was a big part of my life from like 18 to 33. You know, it's like, whoa, uh, can I be somebody different? Can I be this person I always envisioned that I was? And I pretty much had to kill off the old idea of who I believed I was to create the space to literally lean into who I wanted to become. and. And that was okay. You know, it was totally okay. It was a bit intimidating. It was scary. I, I wasn't always sure what I was doing, but I had this new skill called vulnerability where I could ask for help and be okay with asking for help. And, and fortunately for me, when I'd ask for help, often there's always people there with their hand extended, willing to help, you know, which, which reaffirmed my desire to also help others. You know, it really did because I was like, man, you, you, thank you. And I want to continue to help as well. Like what you've just done for me right now in this moment. And, uh, and I think it's cool, right? Like when we really start opening up and we start to connect with like-minded individuals like that, we realize that, geesh, the only thing that holds us back in life is typically ourselves, <laughs> you know? And if we Absolutely. just get out of our own freaking way, you know? <laughs> but uh, it's sometimes easier said than done. Yeah. yeah, and I, I think people are, are very willing to help, but they need to be aware, you know. And um, I've yes. struggled with that. I've struggled to to ask for help at times, and then if if people aren't aware, um, they just they just don't know. So uh, That's right. it takes a bit of courage to. It's something I still struggle with, but um, um, I have some friends who are awesome. They're very in my my closest circle. They they're very uh, to the point, as in. You know, you've gone a bit quiet the past few weeks. Mm. What's going on? But not in a not in a pre just, you know, I'm here if you need kind of way, which is pretty cool. That is very cool. I mean, it's I, I think it's wonderful. And I think every man out there, well, every human being should have that kind of connection with people, you know, or community or just even a handful of people. One person, one person that 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 can just help. When, when we're mm. feeling down, you know, to, that can sort of just help us remember who we are and what we're about and all the great things to be grateful for. And sometimes it's it's tough, right? We get into those cloudy spaces or head spaces and uh, things aren't clear, <laughs> you know? It's uh, pretty awesome that even through the veil of this screen and the internet and you're, you're in Vancouver and I'm in Hamburg, we can have a, yeah. we can have a conversation like this. It's, it's true. It's, it's really yeah. cool that you can, that we can do that. Well, I have to commend you, though, Daniel, because it's also you're a wonderful conversationalist, but also you create a very safe space. You know, I feel very comfortable. I feel like we've known each other for a long time, but I also feel like we'd be guys that could go out and have a couple of soda waters, you know, and uh, <laughs> go for a hike, a workout, right. you know, like, but have a great conversation and connection, you know. And I think that's the the power of connecting with people with similar values, you know. It's, it's amazing how quickly that energy exchange can happen when we allow it to, right? Yeah, I appreciate that. We can rock those soda waters sometime. Uh, <laughs> to bring it home, I mean, you've yeah, you've obviously yeah. explored a lot of a lot of challenges and things that people could do. Mm -hmm. But what would you, given where you're at now, what what would you recommend to the listeners as a as a small but big <laughs> challenge that they could it may perhaps attempt? Well, I'm a big believer that fitness is a wonderful conduit to change. You know, fitness has been such an integral part of my journey. And, and really every time I've gone through big change, like even a decade ago, I was diagnosed with a, a chronic autoimmune disease that I never realized I had. And, uh, but it turned me getting to burnout, <laughs> you know, to literally overworked, under recovered, getting to a place where I was just like, so like running on fumes that my immune system crashed and, and it became very apparent. I've got a condition that's been underlying, but because I was so fit and healthy, a lot of the symptoms were constantly masked. Even though when I think back and I was like, yeah, I remember being tired a lot of the times or, or I get like a cold and it would just linger for 10, 14 days, you know, like weird. It would just, but so I all of a sudden everything was like, Oh, okay. It all makes sense now, you know, but, but 
why I'm bringing this up is even that I had to change how I train, change how I recover, change certain lifestyle habits to get me back to thriving rather than just feeling like I'm barely surviving. And, but it was always fitness, you know, that because it provides wonderful physical transformation, but also, uh, um, you know, and I'm not trying to get a little woo here, but that, that mental health component or that, that perspective that we have on not only ourselves, but the world that we live in, it shifts as we gain that inner confidence in ourselves and we challenge ourselves through tough uh, workouts even, you know, and, uh, but I think it's a beautiful thing for people to begin with is just commit to your health, you know, and, and fitness is a direct tie in to seeing so many markers improve, you know, like after a workout, I've never had anybody say, you know what, I feel worse after my workout than I did before I started. You know, I, I don't. And, and also I encourage people do it first thing in the morning. Like if your motivation is best in the morning, do it in the morning. Oh, well, I kind of sleep. till this time and I got to get to work by this time. I don't think I'm gonna have time. Like get up earlier, <laughs> Like you know, go to bed a bit earlier, get up a little earlier so you can commit that minimum 30 minutes to yourself and just see what happens, you know? And, and as soon as that new ritual or routine develops, that habit of, of prioritizing your fitness it often will influence the rest of the decisions you make in the day because you start feeling so good first thing in the morning. It's like, I don't want this feeling to go away. Oh, in Canada, we have something called the double double. Okay. Tim Hortons. And you might remember that when you were here on your visit, they're all over the place, but uh, this it's a, it's kind of a funny thing, but it's like sort of like a fast food restaurant for or a convenient restaurant for donuts and baked goods and coffee. Canadians are famous for the double double with a donut, you know, so a double double means two sugars, two creams in their coffee, along with some sugary pastry. And this is like a just something that people will often eat, you know, and or have a mid morning snack. They've had breakfast. Now they'll have a mid morning or mid afternoon to pick themselves up again. Right. It's this constant energy roller coaster we're on with our nutrition choices. But I find when people commit with fitness first thing in the morning, they don't want that good feeling to go away. They make better decisions throughout the day more health-minded decisions. And so that's why I say, you know, if there's one thing to get people started, that's it, you know? And if you're stuck with how to do that, I mean, I've got so many free resources on my website and, and you know, not, not to be a plug here, but that's what it's there for. I've got a bunch of workouts. Uh, I've even got uh, downloadable copies of my book for the free PDF. Like I, I, my publisher hates it that I do that, but uh, I'm like, <laughs> whatever, it's my book. I can do what I want, <laughs> you know? And uh um, because I just want people to be empowered to have the knowledge to turn into internal wisdom. And sometimes we just need someone to show us what to do to get started. And uh, but that's that would be the one thing I would recommend people to start with is recommit to your fitness and see what happens and, and give yourself at least a minimum of one month. Be really committed. It's going to suck the first week. It will. Maybe the first two weeks. It will. In, in CrossFit, they have a wonderful saying, embrace the suck, <laughs> you know, and, and, and really it will be hard. It will be. I mean, especially if you've been 10, 15 years without doing any of that, those types of activities, you've normalized being inactive. So I'm asking you to create a new normal. Your new normal is you prioritizing your physical fitness. It's going to take a little time to adapt, especially the longer you've been away from that, <laughs> you know, um, but that's okay. It's okay. It will become more comfortable. You'll see the benefits and that's going to get you excited to keep going. And, and then watch out because it will feed into every aspect of your life. Every aspect. It doesn't matter. I I, I always invite people to challenge me on that. I have yet to have one. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've never had anybody do that. And, uh, you know, even as a joke, I tell people like, hey, if, if your hardest meal a day is to eat healthy, make that the meal you prioritize, you know. And so often I see lunches challenged, especially with like a lot of the executives and people I work with, you know, like that midday is like usually very challenging. There's lots of other stuff going on. I'm like, well. Have a great big salad with some sort of lean protein. Uh, I often say cedar plank salmon. So uh, <laughs> you know why? Of you course. know why? Canadian, yeah, you bet. It's awesome. <laughs> um, but something that you're proud to consume, but also something that makes you feel very good about the decision. I've never, ever had a client message me and say, Ty, I'm really mad at myself for eating that salad for lunch today. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I have yet to have that. I've never had someone say, Hey, that workout you programmed for me the, uh, today, you know, like, oh, feel worse now you know like I, I really don't feel good about doing it like I, i've never had that conversation right now they might say well wow, man you put burpees in your day i hate burpees i'm like that's oh, okay i don't care <laughs> but do you feel better now after doing it I'm like oh yeah i do great there you go so uh you know learn to love them but th th those would be my 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 pieces of, of advice i guess you know for, for people to latch on to and do what they want with awesome the key word i think is commit there 
Yes. <laughs> but no, I'll put a I'll put a link to your website in the in the show notes uh, so people can find that. And well, again, a real honor and a privilege, and uh, let's do it again. Thank you for creating a space like this. I, I I don't know how often you get acknowledged for this, but the the work that you do in creating this and to allow us to be flies on the wall for these types of conversations is is amazing. And I uh, just want to acknowledge you and, and thank you very much for doing this. And, and it was an absolute honor for me to be here and connect with you and and uh, and your audiences. So uh, uh, thanks again for that that opportunity. It's a pleasure. I, I appreciate the acknowledgement. There you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you wish to suggest a challenge or be a guest, please reach out on my website at danthomas.net. Also, any reviews on Spotify or Apple are very much appreciated as they help the show grow. There's also my YouTube channel, which has some of my other projects. Thank you so much, guys. All the best with whatever challenges you're facing this week, no matter how big or small they are, and I'll catch you on the next episode.